the secrets to your hospital's success in decreasing maternal mortality? Many that I'd like to share with you. Have a facility that is equipped and made to be functional 24 hours a day. So when an emergency comes, we can deal with it immediately. We're not looking for who, you know, where are the instruments, they haven't been sterilized yet. Uh, have a, an equipment, equipped and ready facility. One, two, ready and trained staff who are trained to deal with emergencies because the emergencies is what they're trained to deal with. <coughs> Three, have a laboratory that is also functional 24 hours. Have an ambulance that is available 24 hours. Have anesthesia that is available 24 hours. So when somebody comes in bleeding with a placenta previa, that's one of the things that kill quick. Um, the surgeon is there, the woman, the, the anesthetist is there, the instrument staff are there, the equipment has been sterilized and is ready because you have several operating kits. So when you use one, there's still two or three more. And the routine is there. You, you practice that, you're trained to do it, and you cut the, sh the time as short to as little as possible to get that woman on the table. The, what takes the longest is to get the approval of the family because they have to, uh, to sign for the authorization. Mm -hmm. Very often we're sitting there, the surgeons are gloved and washed and ready, but the family is still thinking about whether they would allow the woman to be operated or not. So you, that is, that's, that's the secret of it. Yeah. And building a hospital that is intended, that is built, to deal with these operations. And, you know, I didn't build a hospital so I would have women come in to have, uh, I don't know, comfort or, or, or have a holiday camp. I built a hospital to deal with these emergencies. Great. And we're very blessed. We're able to save as many as, as we can. And we still think we could have saved even more because there are still conditions that have come to us too late that we're not able to save. But you learn from that and you spread the message that people who need, who's, who, you know, when the baby's not coming out, don't wait for the next day or for the sun to rise. Call us at two o'clock in the morning. We'll send somebody and bring that person here. Don't waste time. There's an emergency. We're ready to deal with it. Great. Thank yeah. you. Um, so your hospital's goal is to train and equip 1,000 midwives to provide medical monitoring, treatment, and education in Somaliland. Yes. What are the key factors um, for your success that are helping you achieve this ambitious goal? Well, they have seen the good work that the ones who were trained, trained in the beginning have done. And at first, people didn't know what we were talking about. Why have young girls coming to deliver women when we've always had old women mm. de delivering our women. So you convince them that yes, the old women did a lot of good work, but now there's younger ones to help them. You don't say take over from them. Right. You say to learn from them and help them and work with them. And gradually the old women understand that these young girls know much more about anatomy and physiology and obstetrics than they did because they're trained, they're literate, they're professionals. And I'll tell you a story. When I came back from the UK in 1961, people as the first and only qualified midwife and they would say, what? This little girl is going to deliver babies, women? But she's only, you know, I was 23, 24. But she's a, she, you know, what does she know about delivering babies? And I, I was qualified. I was delivering women in England. I, you know, I, um, they had their doubts. Until one night, a woman who was known as a faith healer, and people, you know, would go to her if they had uh, problems, like, oh, my, my, my wife, I've been married to her for 20 years. She hasn't given me any sons yet. She would pray on them, and hopefully something would happen. Or my child is five years old, he still doesn't walk. And, you know, that kind of a faith healer. 
And when she had a baby, the placenta wouldn't come out. Mm. And the, the woman who delivered her didn't know how to get a placenta out. Mm. And I was called and um, went to the house because they were not going to move Kyria out of my house. She's a big, important woman. You know, I went to Kyria, took my delivery bag, and all Kyria had was a full bladder. So put a catheter in, drained the bladder, and delivered us a placenta smoothly. That opened the, their eyes that this little girl, 23, 24 year old, who they considered little girl, could do something that the big old midwife was not able to do. And that became what ticked my ability and gave confidence to the people. So when you've been doing that and training midwives since 1961, and many of the women who are older women now, older midwives, were trained by me many years ago. So it's by trial and error and proof of your ability. That's what gets you there. And now everybody wants their daughter to be like me. Mm -hmm. And I say, no, not like me, better. That's great, thank you. Um, so one of the causes you're passionate about is stopping the practice of female genital mutilation. Can you tell me more about what your hospital is doing to prevent FGM? Well, my, well first of all, I pioneered the fight against FGM, period. Yes. And I'm still fighting it. Yes. And whatever I, whatever I do, whether I was within the World Health Organization, I was fighting it. When I was a UN diplomat, I was fighting it. When I was foreign minister, I was fighting it. When I was the first lady of the country, I was fighting it. It's something that needs to be fought by everybody and all the time. And my hospital has given me that venue where I have thousands of students who I can train and who I can teach about the harmful effects of female genital mutilation. And it's in their curriculum, it's compulsory, it's not an option, it's what they need to do if they're going to train with me. So I'm training my foot soldiers. I'm multiplying my terrorists against FGM. <laughs> and that's what we're doing. And that's what's helping us see, for the first time, a dip in the numbers of women who have had type 3 female circumcision. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Do you have any final words of wisdom that you would like to share? Well, I, I would like the world to learn from the achievements of Somaliland, a country that is not politically recognized, but is doing so much better than many countries that are recognized. A Somaliland is a poor country, a country that has very little resources that are developed, a country that is not even on the map of the world because it's not politically recognized, but it's making so much progress far better than many other countries in the world. And if Somaliland can do it, anybody can, learn it, can do it and learn from the achievements of Somaliland.